The Quillen Brush was established in 1976 as an outgrowth of a part-time business run by Alan and Patricia Ahern, who started collecting and cataloging books in the early 1960s. The Aherns have over 45 years of experience in the field. At present, the Quillen Brush is operated by Alan and Pat and their two daughters, Beth Fisher and Sue Regan. I'm currently here in your beautiful, what do we call this, the library? The office. <laughs> which looks out on a Maryland forest. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. As much as anyone, you've paid attention to the pricing of books over the years and how they've ebbed and flowed. I just wonder if you could predict the future for us and tell us what's going to happen with the pricing of rare modern first editions, those kind of collectible books, with the advent of the Kindle and the e-book and that kind of technology. I think it's going to make books much more valuable first editions. The reason is it's very nice that you can get something very cheap and read it on the uh, internet if that's how you're inclined. But wonderful books, good books, are not going anywhere. They're stable. I don't know, to listen to a book is fine if you're driving, but the feel of the book, the smell of the book all adds to its beauty. I just, I think it's going to do nothing but make collections more valuable. I think that it would appear, you would think, unless readership increases greatly, that if the readership uh, stays about the same and any portion, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, go to Kindle or go to some sort of uh, other format to read the book rather than a paperback or a hardback, it will mean there'll be lower numbers produced of the first edition and probably of all the prints, uh, which would make them even more valuable, you know, given that most books aren't very valuable. Uh, let's say. You know, there's a very small percentage of books that are really collected. When you look at five or ten years down the line, the, these books, if you know, if they hit 5,000 instead of 10,000 or 10,000 instead of 20,000, they're going to be scarce. It will make that market probably relatively stable. The, I guess the big question, too, is the population is going to be expanding. I just wonder about the percentage of that population that's going to be interested in collecting books. It's always been pretty minute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe what a tenth of one percent or something like that it's, right. it's really a very small population now and as the population ex expands uh, I wouldn't think it would get any smaller in physical numbers but you know we've always been concerned that we you know we're not having young collectors and all our collectors are dying and you know this goes on but I, I think there's all, there'll always be a very very small percentage of people that'll collect we hope so anyway one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm writing a series of articles on just ideas on what to collect. I wonder if you could share with us some of the most successful or satisfying collecting ideas that you've ever come up with yourself. It's hard because everybody, I think, should collect something they, they actually enjoy. In most of the world, the collector, if they, they are interested in something nobody else is interested in, that's something they should probably collect. We had a friend of ours, and this is years ago, who, who loved the pictorial covers on books around the turn of the century. Nobody collected them. They would go around and buy just beautiful examples, didn't have to be first, of pictorial covers. Mm -hmm. And they amassed two or 3,000 of them. Uh, by the time somebody decided that all of these people, the artists who did these covers, should actually be collectible. Not mm -hmm. for huge amounts, but you know, for 100 bucks or 200 bucks instead of $3 or whatever they paid. And I always thought that was interesting that they just picked out something that they liked but uh, nobody was interested in. It's hard. People say, well, who should, you know, what author is going to be hot? I mean, none of us really know that. I mean, you can look at certain authors and they're collected, but we have people like Cormac McCarthy, you know, where he was collected. Uh, for years, but his first book was selling for a couple hundred dollars, and all of a sudden he writes all the pretty horses, and he becomes the hottest thing in the world. And his the book selling, first book selling for two thousand, or three thousand, or four thousand dollars. And they They're make all, movies as well. Make and movies, yeah. yeah. But the collectors always were aware of Cormac McCarthy. The collectors told us that Cormac McCarthy was important because once you get past forty or fifty dollars that somebody's paying for a first edition when they can go get a paperback. Obviously, there's interest. So when All the Pretty Horses came out, his first book was probably selling for $300. Well, that's, that's a lot of money. So there was a certain, again, very small number of collectors who said, this man's important, and I'm going to collect him. You know, a lot of this is matching your taste against the public, I guess, you know, if you pick somebody. I mean, it was something like uh, William Kennedy, for a while, hit with the Albany Trilogy. And Ironweed was turned down by 15 publishers. And then it finally got published, and it won a Pulitzer, and all of a sudden he was, again, his first book went up in value, but it was a similar thing. People had collected Bill Kennedy for years, uh, but not for a whole lot of money.
one of, one of your books, it focused on the value of the first book, of a whole range of authors. Right. Why did you do that? Hey, you know what? If you're just beginning to collect and you think you'd like to collect a certain author and you look it up in that book, if the first book is not selling for a lot of money, that's one you read, you don't necessarily need to collect because the first book's one that begins to show where the value is. In other words, if the first book's $100, you probably most of the rest of the books are going to be less than that. That and whatever book of theirs is maybe won a major prize. Right, though. later on, yeah. We used to use it for telling people, look, if, you, if, if you're somewhere and you have the second or third book, and the first book's worth $1,000, the second or third book probably is worth 500 or something. If the first book's worth $35, the second or third book, you know. Mm -hmm. So even though it was only a first book guide, it was sort of a, an indicator of the value of the author in the marketplace. And that's why we did it. And then I, always, uh, I used to always tell the authors I knew that people only had one idea and they put it in the first book, and so why read the rest <laughs> of them? You know? Just because you got the better, you expressed it better. And that didn't really make them very happy. No, no. <laughs> often the young author is one who wants to make a difference and prove to the world that they've got talent. Now, there are others, of course, that mature and produce works that contain just as much beauty or, or truth. Uh, there's a couple of writers that, that I, in fact, I read a, a book the other day by uh, James Lee Burke, who's a mystery writer. And we've read most of his books. And he's a nice guy. We met him at um, signings and stuff like that. I was surprised. I thought it was probably one of the, the most well-written books he'd written in 10 years. But it was still a mystery. It was still, you know, death and destruction. I thought, well, maybe he's been influenced a little bit by Cormac McCarthy. But I thought, you know, the characters were really well-defined and just kind of interesting. He's an easy read. Yeah. Because he captures you right away. And then you have people like, we have a friend here, you said bookstore, and of course, Larry McMurphy had a bookstore here from the 70s, because he was always a book scout, and he was always a bookseller. Mm -hmm. He's come out with a, a lovely uh, a book about, about that experience. Just called he? Books. Yeah. We in the trade who know him really thought it could have been more expansive, since he really did know everybody in the trade and dealt with them from the 60s on. It's an it's interesting little book, but as yeah. I say, Larry has so many stories he could tell about the trade and the people that we were all a little disappointed. It was it was a nice read and all. Uh, but Larry's written a lot of books, and he continues to to write every year, write you know a new book. It is sort of all the theme of the of the West. Has he gotten better? I don't know. I mean, the first three or four books kind of really grabbed people, and then of course Lonesome Dove really did. And again, that's uh, that's the one that's worth the most money, I think. Or well, no, probably still the first and second books. Third books would be more than. But Lonesome Dove had about forty thousand copies, so it's not a. It, it, there aren't many rare books, to be truthful. Mm -hmm. The rare book might be one that shows up every five years. And so we don't really deal, I say, with a lot of rare books. We deal with scarce books, books that they're around, but the condition is it's hard to find them in nice condition, things like that. But Lonesome Dove was really not a typical Larry McMurphy book. Most of his books, they're funny. There's a lot of sex in them, and, and Lonesome Dove was just a story that his uncles used to tell him when he was a kid. He saw Lonesome Dove, he basically just wrote it. You know, he just, it was all just stories that he heard, so he constructed it. And then he ended up doing two prequels and two sequels and you know, all that, because everybody liked it so much. I know a bookseller up in Canada who absolutely loves Larry McMurtry because of what he said at the Academy Awards. Oh, right. He, uh, he made a point of... Shouting out. Up. Which one was that? Patrick uh, McGarren. Oh, yeah. oh McGarren, yeah. yeah. I love Patrick. He's got our, our name, except he's got that MC in front of him. Yeah, which means he's <laughs> illegitimate or something, right? Probably Scottish. <laughs> Scottish, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> no, he's, a, he's a good guy. When I worked um, for the Pentagon, I used to take care of something called the DIPSA. This is a defense industry production sharing agreement with Canada. And we would go to Ottawa once a year and have a meeting. And that's where I met Patrick years ago. Loved yeah. But yeah, all the dealers were happy that Larry, you know, he got the thing with Brokeback Mountain. Most movies are, are based on books or stories or you know, some takeoff. Yeah. Now Larry's written scripts all his life, and he's written over well over a hundred of them, and only a few have ever been produced. You know, it's like uh, we used to listen to Mort Saul, and Mort Canadian. Saul disappeared finally after Kennedy and said they, people didn't like them making fun of Kennedy or something, so he wasn't as popular. So he was down at Blues Alley years ago. And uh, they said, well, where have you been? You know, he said, well, there's this uh, big building you know, at Hollywood, and, you, and you, you write scripts. And he said, and when you finish your script, he, he says, nobody ever uses it, but they pay you more money to write another one. And so you tend to never leave the building. <laughs> <laughs> so Larry was a little bit like that. I think Larry kept, you 
That's, he used to get 15000 for a script, and now he probably gets 15000 for a three-page outline or something like that, because he's been doing it for so long. So I think they hire these authors. Huxley was hired, I think. Faulkner, I mean, Fitzgerald, of course, never really worked out, but they, they, they try them all, and it's, sometimes it's a, it's a deal for the author. The author doesn't make much money. He's selling a $25 book, and he's getting 10%, and he's selling 5,000 copies or 10,000 copies, and he's doing one every three or four years, you know. So they say, well, he's a nice guy. Why don't, why don't, we, why don't we bring him back to Hollywood? We'll have him do some scripts, and we'll pay him $100,000, and it'll, it'll be good. And yeah. I think there's, there's something to that, because I remember was, well, he's dead now, James Crumley. We used to meet Crumley at different times at, at different parties at, on, in the West. And Crumley got into that thing where he was going, and he didn't write for 10 years. So didn't ask him. And nobody ever, I don't think any of them were ever produced. I was a thing where I would say, well, they never produce on these. But that's all right. They don't they'll have somebody rewrite them. Yeah. He said, he did one with Fear Loathing in Las Vegas. And I said, really? He says, yeah, but I, I think it was rewritten four times after me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of sad in a way, isn't it? Because the, the the movie business makes such a huge amount of money, and the creativity is, resides in, in books that that really aren't compensated or the people that produce them to any anywhere near the degree that the actors who basically just mouth the words that right, are being they get yeah, hundreds of millions. And the other thing that's very worrisome is we had this this deal with recording, and they'll say, well, now yes, everybody steals the recordings and the music business. You don't sell CDs, but you know you have all this free thing, and then people come to your concert. So I'm saying, okay, so you have these people who are creating music, and now that's free. And then you know I call up one of my grandsons. They'll say, oh, they watch this movie. I said, well, it just came out yesterday. Well, yeah, but somebody went to it and they actually taped the movie and they put it on the internet. And now, I say, I don't know what Google's doing, but, you know, if we get to the point where a lot of text from old books, which would normally stock used bookstores, are free, that's the end of the used bookstores. The collectible books may be right, and the ones that, you know, the $2 books and the $10 books and the, you know, the, the mass stuff. But the, the old used bookstore that just stock out-of-print text, how can it have a future? Speaking about collectors and the types of things that could be collected. What's the most radical, bizarre collection of books that you've ever run into? Do you remember the man who came to see us? Oh yes I do. He collected books bound in human skin. Oh, wonderful. No, wasn't that I stepped behind Alan. Boy, I didn't want to even look at him. He had, he had a cape on. He came to our house one time and he, and he wanted to know if we had He, he, he said he was a collector. He, he only collected books bound in human skin. And did we have any? And he literally had a cape on. It turned out he was a cashier at Safeway. Oh. Had this other persona. <laughs> they used to take criminals, apparently, people that were executed, where they could legitimately get the skin without having family members <laughs> object to it. That's probably the most bizarre. But most of the collectors of the modern first are, are people who've read the books. And they yeah. just decide they want them. They want to have a first printing. It's not because they really want to read it. They may read it, but you know, you know. Then there are people, as I say, they collect Western Illustrated books, or they collect Americana because they like the, or they collect travel books from around the world. Whatever happens to interest. Them. We have uh, investment people, and they, they collect books on financial books on you know, financial management, and some of them bring a lot of money, you know, thousands of dollars. You know. What about heroes for you in book collecting and book buying? book selling world is there uh, anyone that has inspired you I know that I look up to him <laughs> do you <laughs> damn right still <laughs> well, I'm, I am after knowing him 50 years yeah well I'm, I am taller than him, I yeah. Guess yeah yeah I guess Larry influenced me but I, I always call it kind of defective gene where you, you you have this tendency to that you want to collect that and I collected a lot of things I mean comic books and all this kind of stuff. When we give our little book collecting, we talk about we have 13 grandchildren, and we say we have four children, 13 grandchildren, and only one of them has the defective gene. Yeah, maybe Thomas will come along, but, but Justin was like six, and he'd collect G.I. Joes and Big Birds and, and he was doing baseball cards. And, and one day at Christmas, uh, one of his father's friends brought him a, a, a movie. It was a Batman movie, and it was wrapped up. And as he opened it, my daughter Sue, she could see it was something he had. He had a copy, so she was afraid he was going to say, "Oh, well, this is nice. We're going to have one of these." And Justin looked at it. And he said, "A perfect box." He said, "You know, my sister tore my box." And he, he went and put it away. <laughs> I said, "Now you can't teach people that." <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's really, you know, what it is. You have to have this tendency. So with us, you know, I mean, we kind of got into collecting because we had a lot of books, and we kind of got interested in the first edition. I probably got interested, honestly, uh, with, with Bradley. Bradley used to have a gold in your attic in, yeah. the, in the Washington Star. You'd read that and you'd say, oh, that was 
books are worth, you know, the Catcher in the Rye is worth ten dollars, you know, something like that. And that certainly was. The so average. there was a mercenary uh, average, angle. Yeah, the, the avarice was there, and you know, you wanted to. And th I think that's always there. It's not a big motivator for most people, but it's a rationale. So well, I'm not throwing my money away. These are really going to be worth money in the future. You know, that's how you what you tell your wife, and you. <laughs> that's right. When you're smuggling it in. That's yeah. not what he told me. <laughs> He told me that our heating bills were lower than anyone else's because the books insulated the walls. Beautiful <laughs> line. You remember yeah. telling me Bob Smith when he used to come in with the, oh. in the shop? We had a shop for 11 years down in Bethesda. Yeah. We, uh, he was wonderful. He was an ex-China agent, and he would come in, and he had... Sorry, he was an ex-what? He was a China expert for CIA. Okay. That was and his job. Bob would come in, and he had this big coat that was in light material. And he'd buy books. But first, he'd bring some in to trade with Alan. And he would unzip different parts on the inside of his coat where he got these books out. And mm -hmm. then he'd buy them and tuck them in all over, all the way around. And one day, I couldn't stand it anymore. And I said, Bob, what are you doing? And he said, Well, I can walk in carrying two or three books, he said. But my wife will get mad if I bring in any more than that. So. This is what I do. He's bringing these books in. His wife doesn't know it. <laughs> I'm sitting in Alan and Pat Ahern's library study office. It's the, it's whatever. the library. <laughs> here. And what's, what is this, this area called here? Comus. Comus, Maryland. Comus, Maryland, but doesn't have a, a, a post office. Okay. So we actually use Dickerson, which is two miles down the road, which is uh, has a post office. It's in the Sugarloaf Mountain. The only thing in Comus is the Sugarloaf Mountain, and then there's a Comus Inn about two miles this way, and, and us. And we now have a vineyard, Sugarloaf Mountain Vineyard, is right a quarter mile away. One of the best sculptors in the country lives about right over here. Who's that? His name is Walter Mattia, M-A-T-I-A. Okay. And he's done a lot of, he did like the, the Bulls for the Houston Stadium when they did the New Texas Stadium, and he did the Merrill Lynch Bowl, and he, oh, okay. he does a lot of animal sculptures and sells, you know, one or fifty copies, that type of thing. And he, he moved here about seven years ago. Just in, in winding down, I wonder if you could reflect on the fact that there have been a lot of open shop bookstores that, that have closed down in the last 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And what might be required to keep the ones that are open, open? In order to keep the used bookstores, you would have, have to have the landlords or the counties or the states or the feds or somebody subsidizing and nobody's going like, to do that like they do in France I mean give them cheap rents that they can have where they could actually stay in business but I mean nobody when we left we were paying uh, we never really paid anything because Pat managed the mall we were in okay. but we were supposed to be paying like 900 a month or a thousand a month well when they sold the building and our lease came up they wanted 4500 a month Plus they wanted percentages and you had to pay the, the, your percentage of the taxes and all this kind of stuff, and, which in 1980, we said, well, we don't make $4,500 a month. I mean, there's no way we could do it. Given it the ease of buying on the internet, given the fact that, you know, you got the competition of, of people being maybe hopeless. That's why I say I don't really understand what's going on with Google. Yeah. I'm sort of part of it, I guess, because I get, you know, mailings occasionally and I get stuff on the internet, but I'm not sure how much they're going to actually put online. I know they'll pr if they put all the stuff that's just out of copyright online. That's a lot of books that are sold by used bookstores. As you yeah. say, at, at twenty, thirty, forty, fifty dollars, you know, some medium price books that they're not going to sell anymore because the people who buy those are not collectors. Those people no. are basically just want the they content. They want the text. They want yeah. the content. You know? Yeah. And if you give the content away, so that's just another thing that's going to make it hard for a, a normal bookstore to, to stay in business. Let's get positive to close with. First of all, your your favorite bookstores? Well, I got, I got a lot of trouble with that once. Uh, <laughs> Peter Howard didn't talk to me for a year, I think. Serendipity Books, Berkeley. He's the largest bookseller probably in the, on the West Coast. Somebody called us from USA Today once and said, uh, we, we'd like you to tell us your 10 favorite bookstores. And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, that, that would really you know, get everybody mad at me. So they said, well, we really like to put something in. And I said, well, I, I could... I could tell you 10 large open bookstores that are still surviving. And so I did, and I had uh, The Strand, of course, and I had actually, I had Second Story, I had Peter Howard uh, with Serendipity Books, and I had 
Uh, there's a guy King, I guess, in Detroit. Huge you know, warehouse. Thing. Pals, of course, and you know, yeah. All, anyway, it's an handicap. And of course, they publish it as my favorite bookstores. And uh, Peter Howard got so mad because he was lumped in with Pals and with these uh, all these other uh, stores, I guess, that I decided I, I would never do that again. <laughs> okay. Well, then, in that case, could you give me your criteria for what you think? constitutes a really, really good used bookstore? Well, it it would have to have variety. It would have to have all subjects covered, have clean stock. There was a, there was a guy here uh, named Andy Morrison. Clean stock? You mean clean, the books. Good condition. Good fine, condition, yeah. Very good to find. Well, there was a, uh, Andy Morrison had a bookshop called uh, the Georgetown Bookshop because he was in Georgetown for a while, and then he moved very close to us out in uh, Bethesda. And he had you know, everything, any art books, and he had literature and all this stuff. And I could never figure it out, because you'd go in there and you'd find, like, a, a book by Trotsky from 1937 in a dust jacket, and it would be $15, and it would be really... And to me, that was a, a good book. I mean, when you get, when there's a When there's a something that you can find... Yeah, and the price is treasure. reasonable, but yeah. it's it's clean, you know, yeah. it's not tattered, and makes it... Even if you're not a collector, you, you still want, you know, clean books. I mean, nice books, you know. Another criteria would be a moving stock, a stock that well, that's, that's changes. That's the advantage of Peter Howard. And when one of the things that I, I, I said was that, because there's a little snippet on each one, I said that Peter Howard basically drives uh, probably the second largest book market in the country. You might say New York might be the biggest. But as far as San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley, he's the one that brings all the books in. He's where everybody goes. The other he's dealers the one who and trained all from. the dealers. And I remember one another dealer, Jim Pepper, said. Why did Peter get so mad? It was the nicest thing anybody ever said about it. <laughs> yeah. Why did he get so mad? I don't know. I never did quite understand. It, because it was in USA Today or because we mentioned Pal and Second there Story. Was, and yeah, there was somebody in there among somebody in there, the he 10 didn't, he, stores he just, that Alan named as great bookstores <laughs> for their variety, the and huge and stocks, the fact that they were clean, they had a personnel report. Prices are reasonable. You know. But, I don't, but I, then, then he says... <laughs> well, I'm a great bookstore. How on earth could you put me in with these guys? Right, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Kind of yeah. But you yeah. know what? It all worked itself out. Yeah, yeah he finally forgave us after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the, but the that. other thing I was want to go back is, is yeah. like Bartleby's. Bartleby's is a nice little shop. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. But again, it's it's more collector's books probably, or more expensive books. Yeah, it's got a good variety of uh, good titles and yeah. interesting uh, publishers. It's not all just right. double day, or it's there's a good variety yeah. of publishers. Right. And that's one of the things that I was looking at was first of all, you'll probably find something of interest. That's one one criteria. Another one would be you can't get out of there in under an hour. Right. And the third one would be just like the Strand, you just cannot miss this because such great variety there's treasures to be found right uh, and just the general atmosphere with the strand they have a lot of bad books and they have so many good books that you can always find something yeah, and, and that's what the, keeps you going back yeah and they get all the uh, reviewers they all get in there so there's always like these current books at fairly reasonable prices even though they're paid for you know this type of thing you know. and they've got a ton of signed copies too yeah no there I mean there are a lot of there's still a lot of Good open stores, but I, to answer your question, I, I I just can't be optimistic because I think the rents the rents just don't make it possible. I mean, I know the Bowmans or the Bowmans, you know, and, and they have now they open in Vegas. It's always amazing to me that that they have you know very big staff. They have huge overheads as far as being on Madison Avenue, and, and yet they fortunately they somehow they're they're keeping it going. We all sell to them. The deal they is single-handedly raised the. Price of Old Man in the Sea. Old Man in the Sea and Atlas Shrugged went from seventy five hundred books to twenty five hundred books. Just thanks to them. Personally by by them selling those books. So they were all gone. There's not a decent copy around anymore. That's why they're twenty five hundred, all of them. Right. Even though they're all hundred thousand copies as far as their original first print. They have beautiful shops and the one on Madison is beautiful. They, they have a place in Philly. But they're all they're buying the same books everybody wants. That's what always mystifies me. They have to buy the same books that everybody wants to buy because they're the expensive books. And yet, as I say, they seem to still be doing which, which is good, and as long as they're doing what we're figuring. And I think they've helped the trade a lot with their New York ads, those full-page ads. Made yes. people aware. Your favorite little trip, do you have a little favorite route 
we drove across country a number of times, and, and as, a, as our old friend Larry Moskowitz used to say, he was with Joe Dupre, Ralph Sipper, and Joe was the provider in Santa yeah. Barbara, and Larry was the buyer, and he would say, well, he said, books are like marbles. If you put them on board, they all roll to the edges, which meant that there really isn't anything in Kansas. And, <laughs> but we did it. We drove in the 80s and 90s. We must have drove across country to doing the fairs. We would take six or eight weeks and go to all these stores, the open stores. We'd go down you know, through Tennessee and Texas, and then the other side, and we'd go up the other. But we did that, as I say, at least three or four times, and, and basically would just not try to drive. We would take 10 days to get to yeah, the coast and just, just spend time going to bookstores, basically. Well, well we that's the only way you could get books. I mean, there wasn't... Yeah. We took our children no. with us. One. Yes. <laughs> that was the end. They would never go with us again. That's true. <laughs> so the tour is... You, the, you don't have a little, like, a two-day no, really. memorable... We'd go to Asheville to see Chan, and the, you know, the captain of the book show. Yeah. We'd yeah. go to, you know, Charlottesville and see the dealers in Charlottesville. I mean, that's a nice There's quite a few down there, aren't yeah, there, right, right that's, in Charlottesville. That's Charlotte. actually, and it's it's nice country. Well, that's because the rare book school is there. I think yeah. that's probably the... There was a time when they didn't have any bookstores, uh, except for textbook stores, but then a number of them moved down there. And then, you know, basically in the uh, in the 80s and 90s, there were quite a few open shops. There probably aren't that many open shops anymore now. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of dealers down there. And no, I was down there, and there's there's probably about four or five just in, in that the, little in the mall, little town area. There. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, But it's funny riding with him. He has a natural instinct for where they are. He doesn't know where they are. And you can smell it. Yeah, we always went to the bad areas in town. So that'd be good. Isn't that interesting? But it's true that. And the, they were there. And and be, before nobody, you know, before the internet, a lot of these dealers. I mean, that's how we made our money. They didn't know. They'd say, "Well, how, what do you want?" Right? So I, I go into the store. It's got ten thousand books, and I, you know, I'm there an hour or two, and I. I I buy 10 books I can make money on. Yeah. I don't care what they are. The whole yeah. point is, can I make money on them? Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for anything. They said, well, what are you looking for? I said, well, I'm not looking for anything when I go in. You, know. you can look and you can see the book club. You, know, you can look at the spines and, and reject so many of them. You know. Quickly. And you're looking for, you know, basically a, something, again, clean. But that's the way we used to do it. But now, people look on the internet and says, oh, this is a $100 book. They may not have priced $100, but in the old days, they might have priced it $20. You know, you could buy it. Yeah, it's kind of sad that way too, isn't it? Because the chance of finding something right. is. But it's still. I mean, you can do it on the internet if, if you do it. I mean, you can go around, and there's this huge range. Like uh, I had somebody want to sell me these Philip Roths, and, uh, and we know, we've known the guy quite a while, and he had other authors. But Philip Roth didn't win many prizes. His first book won, uh, I think, a National Book Award. Uh, then he didn't win another prize for 50 years or something. And all of a sudden, he won Penn Faulkner twice and Pulitzer's and National Book Awards and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's because they were recognizing his career. Yeah, and so he uh, he used to sign books pretty well. But last year, he, he's gotten very bad about it. He won't, won't sign books. And we were at Penn Faulkner twice with him, and, he, and neither time he really would sign books, which is the only author that ever been to Penn Faulkner that we know that didn't. Uh, but at any rate, he had all of Philip Roth's books signed. Well, the first, if you look them up on, the, on ABE, there's a guy that has every book signed by Philip Roth for $990. Each so, one? Yeah. yeah. That's the first price you get, $990. Then the next one is $250, and the next one's like $150, and the next one's $75. And, you know, and they're all fine, and they're all nice. You know, they have, you know. I said, well, I think the Philip Roths are better, worth about $20,000, $22,000 retail. Oh, he said, we're way off. He said, I, I got about fifty or 60000 for them. I said, so they were all $990, right? You know, that's, you know, I said, you really can't do that. That's part of the problem. Yeah. But when you, if you look for things, you can usually go down. Because we buy a lot of books for people, and I just, I, I look, and I don't want a bad copy or anything. But occasionally, there's these people who kind of, they're not sure, they don't, they're yeah. not or they want good to move dealers. It. Yeah, and there's some that, you know, they, they'll tell you it's a first edition, and then you, when you buy it, it's a 20th printing, and they'll say, well, but it's still a first edition. Right? Yeah, right. But then you have the people that, that are very unsure, and so you read the description, and you'll think, God, this book looks really underpriced, you know, and, and you'll call the person, and they didn't want to, you know, they, they were just unsure of themselves, and so you say, well, can you get the book, and they describe it to me, and I, I've actually bought some really nice copies mm -hmm. on the internet. It's almost like the thrill has moved away from going around <laughs> to the stores to online, where, yeah, where you But it's just so much harder online, because yeah. you can't see everybody. Yeah. It's no serendipity. You know, if you want to bring in new people, I always thought Ken Lopez. He's a wonderful uh, man. He, he he always has his write up. Every you know, was 
that this book and how it's the greatest book. Very in the generous world, with you know? that. Yeah, yeah, very generous. We love him. We quote him when he when we do our new books. We always say, you know, he, he always will, he'll catalog and have this wonderful description of it. But the point was we realized what Kenny realized that a lot of us weren't didn't ten or twenty years ago was that there are a lot of people who like to like something that they didn't know the foggiest thing about anything. <laughs> they didn't have any favorite books. And so somebody had to tell them why this was an important yeah. book or why would they want this book. But that's fine. Yeah, but I mean, and so you're all of us got and you're you know, more description, more descriptive yeah. of the book itself. You know, yeah. uh, before we just figured, well, the collectors all seen, they know the book. We don't have to tell them about the damn book; they know about that. Yeah, yeah, and you almost don't <laughs> want to insult them because yeah. So you, you know. just describe the condition, and that was yeah. pretty much yeah. it. Yeah, and then you realize, well, that's not you know, you got to go a little further now. My final question is: uh, Are you going to do this until you uh, drop dead, or uh, yes. we have to because we don't have any retirement? I mean, it's something we love. We like the people in it. If somebody is uh, really obnoxious, they're not your customer anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's just a fact. We don't have to deal with that. It keeps your brain alive, too, exactly. doesn't it? Yeah. So, you yeah. know, you, exactly. you, you learn one more new thing, and it opens the page to a whole range of well, others. Thank you for taking the time and the trouble. Oh, well, you're welcome. To, uh, it's always fun to pontificate. <laughs> Especially in these surroundings. Yeah. It's yeah. a great, it's a nice room. Yeah, yeah we really like it. We'll show you the rest of the house if you want. Yeah, but I'll just wind off by saying that Alan and Pat Ahern are the proprietors of Quill and Brush, a store that used to be open, now is open by appointment. Thanks again. Thank you for talking to us. For listening.